Ladies and gentlemen, I'm joined by our special guest of the episode. I'm joined by On3 Sports' very own J.D. Bakel. J.D., welcome to the show, man. Glad to finally have you on. Yeah, man. Glad we got to get this thing done. I know it's been in the works for a minute. Big fan of all your work and fired up to talk some ball with you, brother. It's it's about that time. It's, it like, is about that time. I know. It's, I watched the NFL preseason game last night. Like I'm so desperate for football. I watched the Jacksonville Jaguars play. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm excited to talk some ball. Uh, we're going to talk some Pac-12. Uh, for those who don't know, JD has blown up on the scene. You've probably seen him on YouTube, social media. JD, if you want to give an intro to the people uh, who are listening to the show right now who might not be as familiar with your work as I am. Yeah, man. So I was in Waco, Texas for the last three years working on a YouTube channel under this conglomerate, 365 Sports. They were kind enough to allow me to um, use their resources and work there in a, in a part-time fashion uh, while doing my, my eight to five. And then um, about, I guess it was maybe three months ago or so, got uh, reached out to by, by on, on three and fast forward the tape. And here we are running uh, running the gun in here in Nashville and, and doing all of our, our uh, national college football topical stuff on the YouTube channel. So we got a show on a, on a daily basis called The Hard Count. Um, we just did our longer form episode actually uh, earlier today that will set to come out on Sunday. And then we do more digestible like six to 10 minute videos as well so uh it's been a blast it's been a whirlwind but yeah that that's uh that's me in a nutshell so if you haven't yet go check us out on youtube as well at uh at on three yeah it's been great uh daily videos i actually just watched the one you did on uh alabama getting uh caleb downs uh yeah very insightful there love that so we're talking pac-12 this episode this is probably one of the most exciting conferences for me because a blue blood is coming back into contention after years and years of being down. Uh, the BCS busters that we used to love in Utah is the national is like they're, they're on the scene. This could be their year. UCLA's coming back, Oregon. We don't know what they're going to be without Mario Cristobal. So this conference, I feel like it's going to be complete madness, but it's in the best way. Um, I'm lead, I'm very high on Utah this year. But man, USC looks like the sexy pick, especially with like Vegas and and all the on the sports betting apps. Like, what do you think so far of this conference, just on a on a piece of paper? It's fascinating. I mean, I think you said it really well. It's fascinating because there's so many pieces to it. To where you have kind of the known commodity in Utah. To where I mean, they're going to have a great test week one against Florida, and they just they know who they are, right? Like that's probably the most certain we can be about a program is. Utah's going to play tough defense. They're going to run down hell at you. They're going to have playmakers on the outside. Like Utah knows who they are. We know who Utah is. But across the board, even though we have familiar faces, thanks to the transfer portal, we don't know how they're going to gel in some of these programs. So you got USC with a new face with Caleb Williams and Lincoln Riley. And then you look at Oregon, who's been, you know, relevant in that landscape in the Pac-12 for the last however many years. Now they got Bo Nix from Auburn. I mean, there's just so many unknowns in the Pac-12 this year to where I'm with you. If I had to pick a team today to win that conference, I'd be hard-pressed to go against Utah, but I I'm very much excited to see how Caleb Williams takes that next step in the Pac-12 because there were times last year for all of his talent where he looked confused playing against some of these more complex defenses in Oklahoma State and Baylor. So what does the Pac-12 bring to the table um, with the college football playoff conversation as well, something I'm watching. So, I mean, we, we, we're going to obviously sit here for a minute and talk about these storylines, but we could kill a lion's share of the time just talking about all the unknowns within this conference, but excited that it's going to be uh, relevant on the on national landscape, hopefully. Yeah, and you touched on it. Week one, Utah, which is, I think, probably one of the more underrated non-conference games on, on the opening week lineup. Utah traveling to Gainesville. Uh, against Florida. Florida, we don't really know what they're going to be this year. I'm actually a little bit higher on Florida than a lot of people. I love Anthony Richardson. I think he is going to he's he's going to arrive on the scene. I think he's going to shock a lot of people. Um I I talked to a lot of people who are really close to that program and they're saying that he is the real deal. Uh probably the best quarterback they've had down there since 15 put on the jersey. So I I'm a little concerned about that game because Utah traveling to Gainesville, it's going to be hot. I know it's a night game, but the humidity there is ridiculous. The swamp is one of the toughest places in college football to play. If the, if Utah goes out and they ball out, like I expect them to, I think it's going to be a tough game, but I think they'll run away with it late. If they go out and put on a show, 
I think Utah cruises through this schedule, especially against USC. Um, I, I think the one game I'm a little worried about is at the end of the year at Oregon in November, Utah got the best of them twice last year. I see that as a revenge game. I think I think Oregon's uh, I think they're the best team in their in their division. Two of the best linebackers in college football come back. Um, defensive mind guy, but if they get past Florida, I, I think Utah runs away with it, and they will be undefeated going into that matchup on November nineteenth. Yeah, I mean that's kind of going to be the the make or break game, right? November nineteenth at Oregon, which I think is is the big variable, but. I mean, I, I'm really thinking we're going to learn a lot about both Florida and Utah week one. Like, we, we may not get the whole story on Florida yet because it's their first year under Napier and Anthony Richardson's first year, you know, really being the starter. I know he played a lot last year, but being the guy. Um, but I think, yeah, it, it's interesting because there's somewhat a level of disrespect that I think Utah is getting coming to SEC country, only favored by a point and a half. Um I'm with you. I think Utah is going to going to run the table in that game. Now, I don't know that it'll be a, a blowout, but I do think it'll be a pretty decisive win by Utah. I mean, they're, they're just so physical and it's tough, especially in that first week for a first year head coach, first year really starting quarterback in Anthony Richardson to go against a team that's so sure of themselves. Like we I mean, I said it before, Utah is probably the most proven commodity for sure in the Pac-12, if not all of college football. Like we know what they're going to get every single week. I mean, Kyle Whittingham has that program just how he likes it. They're going to be tough. They're going to be gritty. Got Cam Rising at quarterback, so there's not going to be any drop-off there. I mean, we saw it last year in the Rose Bowl with how tough they played Ohio State. And I know Ohio State didn't have all of their dudes, but I think Utah needs to be taken more seriously on a national level because you're right. I mean, looking at the schedule, I got it pulled up right here. I don't see a team that's going to – I mean, I don't see a team where they're going to be outmatched. Now, USC – who knows how much firepower they have and who knows what they are in October. There's still a lot to be determined there, but I mean, Utah is on my short list of teams that could crash the college football playoff in terms of being one of those party crashers. So learn a lot week one, more so about Utah, I think, or excuse me, more so about Florida, I think uh, with, with that store developing, but Utah is going to give them the business in the swamp. I think it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. I think too, Tavon Thomas, I, I think it's one of the best running backs in the country. No one talks about it. He quietly had a monster year last year. I mean, if you have 21 touchdowns on the ground, you're doing something right. Um, and then if you watch that Rose Bowl game against Ohio State, Rising didn't play. It was a, he's a walk-on freshman who came in and lit it up. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I agree with you on the Florida take. I think if Florida can keep it at a touchdown game, I think Florida can hold their head up high and be like, okay, we got something here. We're, maybe, not, maybe not this year in 2022, but we're going to compete for the East in 2023, 2024. And it's not just going to be the Georgia show anymore. Um, yeah. But but the team that everyone seems to pick, Vegas loves them. Everyone else loves them. USC, Lincoln Riley, Caleb Williams, Jordan Addison. Uh, you got Die from Oregon coming in. I mean, USC added some studs. The reason why I'm not going with USC is I don't trust what they have up front on the offensive line and the defensive line. So it's just hard for me with Oregon and, and Oregon and, and Utah and even UCLA too, with the in with the up line um, line of scrimmage play. I think USC is going to get pushed around. I have USC losing three games this year, uh, and not because mm. I don't think they're a good team. I think Utah will get them at Utah. Utah or USC has historically struggled um, at, at Utah. I think UCLA is a little bit of a better team top to bottom than USC is this year. I think Chip Kelly is getting that uh, program turned around. DTR is back, which it seems like his eighth year in college football at this point. And then Notre Dame as well. I mean, because Notre Dame at the line of scrimmage will push USC off the ball. It seems like Notre Dame pushes out an offensive lineman in the first round every year. Um, but there's a lot of question marks around that program. If I'm just looking on paper, I think USC – uh, gets handled in the last game of the year too. I think next year is the year for USC where it's like, okay, this is it. Lincoln Riley, year two. Caleb Williams is back. I think Caleb Williams will probably come back for another year. Um, and then you're getting all these amazing five star guys out of LA, uh, Arizona, Oregon, Washington. So that's that's the only reason I'm not taking USC this year. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the teams that historically, especially in the last four or five years 
this this game is one in the trenches. Like I know we've developed a lot in the spread and we've developed a lot with how much we're throwing the football in the vertical attack. And I think that's very real. And that's a reason why USC is going to be competitive this year. But the game's one in the trenches. Like just ask Alabama, ask Georgia. The game is won more often than not by your big human beings pushing their big human beings against their will to where you want them to go. And so for USC, it's just going to take a second, man. Like they, they have so much juice, so much excitement about this program. They're going to be better than they were a year ago. I mean, definitely they're going to be watchable. They're going to be exciting. I still think Caleb Williams puts up video game kind of numbers. Would not be surprised if he ends up going to New York for the Heisman Trophy ceremony. But ultimately, to get to that upper echelon to win the Pac-12, to, to get to the college football playoff, I think you're exactly right. they got to have it in the trenches. And right now, I don't know that they do. That's not saying they couldn't surprise us and still – show up and, you know, show up in October being one of those teams that's in the conversation. But just for what it requires to get to that upper echelon, I don't think USC has it right now. And to your point, Utah does, right? I mean, Utah has those guys up front that are able to get that extra two yards on on third and one or whatever it may be. And so with that being said, until USC takes that next step in terms of adding those kind of big boys up front, it, it might be uh, – nine win season, which, I mean, if you're talking about what USC has been in the past, I mean, I say the past loosely in recent history under the Clay Helton era, I mean, nine wins based on, you know, not making a bowl game last year, you take that every single time. So I'm with you. I think they're still probably a year away from that national excitement in, in terms of what they're doing in November. But with all the talent they have, like you said, the playmakers, they have Jordan Addison, they're going to win some track meets for sure. Like in the in the games where it's a, a scratch or even a, a slight lean on the defensive and offensive line to their opposition, they're going to be able to, I think, um, offset that a little bit with how many playmakers they have. Because it's it's a lot of them, dude. It is a lot of yeah. freaks running around for USC. But nonetheless, excited to watch it play out. It looks a little bit like a Pete Carroll type atmosphere with all these playmakers that they have, where it's like you have like Dwayne Jarrett, Steve Smith, uh, no Lindell White and Reggie Bush yet. Uh, it, but I mean, it, I'm excited to see what he can do because LA, I mean, I think the days of Ryan Day, or, um, Kirby Smart, Nick Saban, and Steve Sarkeesian going into LA, taking guys from modern day, Servite, uh, Bosco, those days are done. I think I, I think you I think Lincoln's just going to have his pick of the litter. I, I, someone was telling me a story when uh, Pete was out at USC and he, he was watching a quarterback play. I think it was uh, Mark Sanchez or like Mission Viejo. And hmm. someone was like, where's everybody else? at?" I was like, Pete's here. It doesn't matter. Hmm. It's like, no, hmm. like why, why even bother showing up at this point? Right. Hmm. So That's I think fair. Lincoln will 100 percent yeah. fair. So I think Lincoln is going to get back to those days. So we touched on Utah. I think we're both on the same point there. I I, I like UCLA a little bit this year too. I I, re, I love watching Chip Kelly at Oregon. It was probably the one of the few reasons I used to do like Pac-12 after dark or Pac-10 <laughs> at the time. Yeah, but yeah. he's finally he's at UCLA. It seemed like last year they were starting to put some pieces together. Had a big opening day win against LSU. Uh, even though LSU kind of had a down year. Is this the year Chip Kelly can finally kind of put it all together? He's got the quarterback, it seems like. He's got a really good running back. Um, he's got a lot of res, uh, starters returning on defense. I know the offense – or I'm sorry, a lot of starters returning on offense. Defense is going to be a little bit of a question mark. But I think I think UCLA can kind of push for like a 10-win season this year if as long as they can just stay healthy and Chip can kind of do what he does. Yeah, and I think the question mark is – how much is the other teams within the Pac-12 catching up, right? Because it seems like UCLA has slowly been building, been building, been building. And now with the transfer portal, you got USC saying, okay, we got this guy, this guy, this guy. Uh, Oregon brings in Bo Nix. And there's all these different pieces that all of a sudden are just ready-made for these other Pac-12 programs. And so if you're UCLA, you're saying, wait a second, you know, wait, we, we were building this thing, you know, the grassroots way. We were growing our talent. We are developing our guys. And so – I think it'll be a matter of how quickly the, do the other dogs in the hunt gel. Uh, because that's my thing with USC. I mean, USC on paper, I mean, has better talent more often than not than UCLA, but especially this coming year with what they've done in the portal. So if it's a matter of, hey, USC doesn't really hit their stride until game six, and then who knows how motivated everybody else is. Jordan Addison's getting ready to go to the combine. Like all these different things play a factor. 
Um, so I think for UCLA, the, the question is not so much within that locker room, but in the external circumstances with, like I said, the Oregon, the USC's, I think Utah is going to kind of just be that roadblock for everybody. But um, I think you, I think you hit it well. I mean, Chip Kelly, to his credit, has um, done more with less the duration of his career. I mean, you see that whether it would be his time in the NFL or what he did at Oregon and now what he's doing at UCLA. It's not to knock UCLA's roster, but more so credit Chip Kelly. Um, so it might not be strictly a talent thing for them, but I think that ultimately they're going to, they may not win the conference, but I would be willing to bet a fair amount of money. They're going to ruin it for a fair amount of teams that are in the hunt in November. Yeah, I, I think you're right too. I, like I said, he, his system and his scheme dominated college football for years and, and actually made a lot of people change the way they play offense uh, with the hurry up and the no mm-hmm. huddle. And I, so I'm excited to have him back. And I think college football is fun when Chip Kelly is in it. But the team that he came from that made him famous, the Oregon Ducks, that's who I have coming out of the other division. I think I just think they're better than everyone else in this division. Washington has kind of been a shell of itself since they made that playoff run with Chris Peterson. Um, I don't trust Colorado. Hmm. Arizona is, is kind of eh right now. So I mean, yeah. ever since Mel Tucker kind of left, it's kind of been a little, little shaky there. I think Oregon has the two best defensive players in this conference with Sewell and Flowers. I think they're going to, I think they're really going to give um, Utah a run for their money in Eugene, but they open up in the Georgia Dome against Georgia, the defending national champs. This game screams trap game to me. And I I, I like, I still am going to take Georgia. But there's yeah. something about Bo Nix that drives me insane, and I've seen him do it multiple times. I saw, I saw the 2019 Iron Bowl where he pulled it out. I've seen him do it multiple times. This, If I'm Georgia, I am not taking this game lightly. Yeah, I mean, you can't. I mean, that's just the fact of the matter. You can't. And I think you're right in saying a lot of it points to kind of trappy sort of feeling with that game. I mean, I think the line that I saw the other day was like Georgia minus 17 and a half. Whew. And don't get me wrong. Georgia recruits better than anybody in the country or on par with anybody else in the country. And so, you know, there's a lot of talk about, hey, they got three starters coming back from that defense. And like, dude, those other ga- the other eight guys are going to be ballers, right? Like yeah. there's not any reservations with that. But 17 and a half is a lot of points to cover. So uh, I, I'm with you. I think Georgia wins. But I, I do think that there's a point in time in that game where we're saying, hey, Oregon's in this thing. And I, and I don't think it's going to be an it's, you know a, a insignificant amount of time left in that. Like it might be a second half, early third quarter where we're saying, hey, Oregon's kind of got the momentum right now. Um, now, ultimately, I think some of it, too, is, hey, Dan Lanning's a first year head coach. It's a first year, you know, in in Eugene for Bo Nix and all of that stuff. But, um, you know, I, I think that plays a factor, probably the experience as well, because, I mean, Kirby just knows how to win. Stetson knows how to win. So that could be, a, be a, you know, ultimately the issue long term. But um, I'm excited for Oregon. I think it's going to be a great litmus test for them to see where they're at. And ultimately, I, I don't know how you pick Oregon to win that game, but I don't think you're crazy if you pick Oregon to cover. No, I, I mean, I'll probably pick them to cover. They they quietly returned 15 starters on this team, eight on defense. Um, a buddy of mine uh, who is on the coaching staff at Oregon said they have some things to figure out, but this defense is the real deal. Hmm. So him saying that, in Georgia, we've seen them. They're a little limited on off on offense. Burton's yeah. gone to Bama. Uh, Pickens has gone in the NFL. It's, it's kind of Bauer, the Bowers show right now. Cook is gone, which I think Cook has a legit shot to win rookie of the year in Buffalo. Hmm. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see Georgia struggle a little bit on defense. I like Oregon's linebackers enough to kind of take Bowers out. However, though, Georgia has a three headed monster at tight end this year. That's the only thing I'm really worried about. So it's, can the Oregon defense make Stetson make a few mistakes? And then Bo Nix has experience playing Georgia. He's played Georgia, I believe three years, pretty close. Yeah. Um, I don't think he won, but he, they were going up against like great historical defenses at Georgia at that time with NFL guys. So Bo Nix drives me crazy. I've seen, he looks like the second coming of Michael Vick or <laughs> he lo- or he looks like uh, the, a wannabe Johnny Menzel in Cleveland. Like he, he drives me insane. But I've seen yeah. him do it. So we talked about the Pac-12. I think we're on the same page. I, I have Utah winning. I think Utah runs the table. I, I I am worried they will drop at least one game. But regardless if they do drop a game or not, 
I if they drop one, I see still see him winning the Pac-12, and I see him going on to the college football playoff as a three or a four seed. Whoa. Okay. Is that like your official pick? Are you taking Utah to make the dance? I am. I, I think this is the year. It. I love I, it. I'm, yeah. I'm t- I, like, I'm tired of the chalk picks. Obviously like Alabama and Ohio state, everyone has them. I think, I think they're the two best teams in the country. Uh, top to bottom on paper. I think, I think Bama and Ohio state will run everybody off. They play this year. I really do. I talent wise. I love Utah this year because they bring back a lot. Their coach has been there. The players have bought into the system. This is a, they're, they're just to me the most consistent team in the country. And so I like their schedule. I think they, I think they will get caught on a weekend, uh, and I believe it'll probably be against Oregon at, at Eugene. But I think they can get revenge in the Pac-12 title game to get there. I just, I just think besides Bama and Ohio State, no one else is going to finish this year undefeated. Yeah, I think that's my concern is if you're Utah coming from the Pac-12, which we all know the national perception, how people aren't staying up late to watch the Pac-12 after dark. They're not sickos like you and me, Cruz. If you have a one-loss conference champion, I know there's a lot of variables to this, but if you have a one-loss conference champion from the Pac-12, how snobby do we want to be about that? Because I think we've seen at times where we see Clemson playing in the ACC, which a lot of people would consider a stronger conference where it's like, Hey, if, if Clemson doesn't go undefeated, they ain't getting in. And then that's kind of been the sentiment. And Clemson knows that from week seven onwards. So yeah, I think the question isn't so much for me if Utah is is going to win the Pac-12, it's do they do it undefeated? And I worry about just the volatility in that conference. And like you said, there's just some tricky games on there. I mean, USC, every single year, it seems like no matter how good they are, I feel like showing up at least one game out of the year. Is it the Utah game? We'll see. But um, I would love to see Utah in the in the uh, no, in the college football playoff. My my concern is that they get to be a one loss champion and they get left out still just by nature of how we perceive the the Pac twelve. But I hope I'm wrong. Maybe it's a different year. So I have three one loss teams um, besides Alabama and Ohio State. I have I have Oklahoma State this year. I'm very high on the Cowboys. I think they wow. put it all together. They were I think they had the big the best defense in the Big Twelve. Uh, I, I'm a little higher on Sanders than a lot of people are, but I feel like Baylor kind of lost a lot this year. Um, I, I, I like what Oklahoma has, but I think Baylor and Oklahoma State are still a little bit better. And then I like NC State this year. I think they are this year's Cinderella team. They returned 10 starters on defense, 11 with playing experience. I like Devin Leary. I like what they have. Um, if they, But again, the Clemson game is going to be the deciding factor. But NC State over the years has proved they're not scared of Clemson. So mm. I think – and, and I'm not the biggest believer in DJ. I think I think he'll end up getting sat about five games into the season. That mm. Wake Forest game for DJ for me is going to be the big one because they go into Wake Forest against Sam Hartman and, um, and, and the Demon Deacons. They want a revenge game, and he doesn't play well. I see Dabo pulling the trigger like he did in 2018 with Kelly Bryant and Trevor Lawrence. I could see it. So with that being said, like I, I, I have Utah, I, again, uh, not undefeated, but at least getting the three or four seed. I would love that. I mean, I'm, I'm all for it. You better believe I'm up late watching Pac-12 after dark and watching <laughs> the Utes go on a, go on a tear here. If nobody else is batting with them, man, I will, I will join you on that soapbox singing the praises of the Utes. Now, they got to get past Florida week one. And we've talked about that, but I yeah. think, I think that's going to be a, a good litmus test for us as to, how much depth this this team has at Utah. Um, In terms of my playoff picks, man, I'm going with the two chalk picks, like you mentioned, with Ohio State, with Alabama, not necessarily in that order. A lot of people are going to pencil in Georgia somewhere in that third spot, and I think there's some ignorance for just how hard it is to get two teams in from the same conference. I mean, I know it's happened twice, but still twice, you know, only ever in the the college football playoff history. I think that's saying something, and also – I think we're giving Georgia a little bit too much credit. And that's not to knock the dogs, but they won, and there's an anonymous coach that said this, they won a lot of times last year in spite of their offense. And now with the presumed step back, we're assuming they're going to take on defense with having lost eight starters. And even if the defense is really good, it might not be generational like it was a year ago. Uh, I think you kind of know what you have in Stetson Bennett. I don't see him taking a huge leap forward. Do they have, like you talked about, do they have anybody else on the outside that can make plays? So there's a lot of question marks to where, hey, if they get into a track meet, even if it is in the SEC title game, I mean, if, they, if they're a one-loss team showing up against Alabama and Atlanta, 
I don't like their chances. And so I do think they'll drop one at some point. I don't know to who, but I think they're going to drop one and then ultimately be a two loss team at the end of the year after losing to Bama and Atlanta. So I like, I like those two. So this is where we differ a little bit here, Cruz. So bear with me. I like Oklahoma. Okay. And I like Oklahoma because I think the big 12 has a throne that is currently vacant. And I think in addition to that, there's a lot of transition going on because you have Texas with their second year under Sark, new quarterback, Iowa State is pretty much figuring out for the first time since spring who they really have on their roster, who's going to start after they had all those senior citizens graduate. Um, and then you got Oklahoma State. And I understand the the buy there for Oklahoma State. Like, I think I could be convinced of that. My biggest thing is Jim Knowles is no longer there, and Spencer Sanders is someone that I don't trust with the keys to my offense. And, and I, I mean, I, there, there's times where he's great. There's times where he's not so great. So for me, I'm not a Spencer Sanders guy. I'm not going to knock anybody who is, but he's just not for me. Uh, in terms of Baylor, love Baylor. Have have a lot of ties to Baylor, but they lose so much production. And so if, if Oklahoma and Jeff Levy and Dylan Gabriel can sync up quickly, I think it's going to be a foot race to see who can can get this thing started the quickest. So, so I don't see a huge acclimation period for them defensively or offensively, honestly. So I like Oklahoma. Uh, I think they maybe win the conference with one loss and get in. And then in terms of the ACC, I think you, you said it perfectly. A lot of it has to do with DJ. And with what he did a season ago, it was 10 interceptions and nine touchdowns, but they still found a way to win 10 games. And so, I mean, I'm just imagining a world where DJ is 20 touchdowns and maybe he's eight picks, maybe he's nine picks. If he's just more effective throwing the ball downfield, the defense is silly. Like seven oh, starters yeah. coming. Oh, I, mean, I mean, front seven's ridiculous. So uh, I would um, say it's, yeah. it rivals that 2018 defensive line with like Wilkins and, and, and oh, it's stupid. And, yeah, it's, it's ins- yeah. I mean, like they legit could have four first round picks on the defensive line alone this year. It's insane. It's stupid. Yeah. So, I mean, I think honestly, if the offense can hold up their end of the deal, if you're, if you're, I mean, let's call it what it was. They were below average last year on offense and still won 10 games. If they can be just a little bit more capable, I mean, if, if they can win a game offensively, you know, there'll be one or two games where it's like, hey, offense, we need you to score 40. Yeah. If they can answer that bell, I think we're going to see Clemson in the college ball playoff as well. But I mean, similar to the conversation we had about Utah, Clemson may need to run the table to get in. I mean, is a one loss Clemson left out in the cold or do you take a one loss Pac-12 champion in Utah? I mean, remains to be seen, yeah. but um, well, I mean, I you're, we'll you're right. Do. You're right on the Clemson front. They do have a tougher schedule. I think Wake Forest is a good team. I think Miami is going to be better this year with Christian ball. I think yep. Florida state's going to be better with uh third year. Um, they, I think South Carolina is not going to be a pushover this year. I think they're going to shock a lot of people. I'm not, I, I'm, I think they could have a legit conversation of finishing third in the East this year. Um, and then NC State, it's going to be big. So they have a chance to play probably about five top 25 teams this year. Hmm. My thing is, though, watching DJ last year, and that, and if it wasn't for how good Venerables was and that defense was, even with all the injuries last year, Florida State took him to the wire. Georgia, Georgia Tech took him to the wire. Boston yeah. College took him to the wire. And it, it, in Georgia, I mean, look, Georgia's defense played outstanding against DJ week one. In fact, like the only touchdown of that game was a pick six because the Clemson defense was shutting down, uh, who was it, JT Daniels in yeah. Yeah. Uh, week one. So if they get that same energy back on defense and everyone's healthy with Brees and Murphy and Thomas, it, it, look out. I, I'm, I'm right there with you. It'll be tough for NC State to dethrone them. Um, but I really think Dabo's best shot is to pull the trigger um, – and start this Cole kid that everyone is excited about. <laughs> um, I, I know I, I've seen I've seen him and I've heard of him, and he looks he looks like the part. He looks like the real deal. I'm not saying he's Trevor Lawrence like, but he could he could make some noise with Shipley and company. Yeah, it's it's going to be fascinating. It really is going to be fascinating to see how much leash he has because Dabo's been super vocal. Came out at you know ACC media day, said y'all are disrespecting him. He's a freak. And so if it's game four and Clemson sitting there in an uncomfortable spot. You know, how, how quickly do you go to Cade Klubnik? So my biggest question is, how ready is Cade Klubnik? Because we, we've we heard different things and read different things and saw him in the spring game to where he's still, you know, getting to his, his physical stature he needs to be at to play. But, I mean, the kid's got the juice. If he's not playing this year, he is I, – I think it's without question he's going to be the, the guy in the future at Clemson. But uh, me, very much like yourself, interested to see how much leash do you give a DJ Uyunglele in his second year as a starter. 
Yeah. By the way, crush that last name pronunciation. Hey, that's, a tough one for, that's a tough one for a lot of people. Uh, it's like when, it. it was like Tonga Vailoa when he came out. That was that was a big one. I think everyone learned how to say it. So we touched on it. We we have our playoff picks. Let me get a couple of bold predictions on your take. Like the year of twenty twenty in college or twenty twenty two in college football. What are gonna be some of your big takes this year? Man, that's a that's a good question. I don't know how bold it is, but I would say I, I tweeted this out actually before we we jumped on here. Uh, I think Nebraska is a bowl eligible team before the month of November. Like I think they win wow. six games before they they get to the month of November. And the schedule is not brutal. I mean, you look at their first four. They have Northwestern to open. They have I think Georgia Southern, North Dakota. Then they play Oklahoma game four. That that'll be tricky, but. I mean, they got like at Rutgers, they got Indiana and a knock on the Hoosiers. They have, they have Purdue, which will be tough. But I'm just looking at the schedule and I'm like, I see six wins for this team before they get to November. So uh, I guess depending on how you feel about Casey Thompson, how bold is that? Um, in regards to Texas, I think there's there's probably some conversations to be had there that are pretty bold. I think people in Austin might be a few steps ahead of whatever bold means, which isn't a knock on that fan base either. But I mean, they you know they expect nine wins from that team. And so... Nine is a lot. Um, I'm trying to think of some other bold predictions here for you. I feel like I'm coming to the table empty-handed. Um, golly, is there, I, like, I do, is there a hot? Is there like a hot, hot take that you have that uh, that you've gotten fried for already? Because I, I I had one uh, recently. And I'll share with you in a second. But yeah, it, it's it's I love hot take season. It's the best. I season. think yeah, man. I, mean, I I usually try and try and steer clear as best I can. I think probably the hottest take I have is. I think you're going to see Dylan Gabriel in New York City for the Heisman Trophy. I really do. I think okay. him and Jeff Lebby, you know, being reunited. And it wasn't like they were together and Jeff Lebby and Dylan Gabriel did, like, decent work. And Dylan Gabriel spelled a few games and, and you know, did okay as a freshman. Like, as a true freshman, he was top 10 in the country in terms of yards. And so for them to reconnect at a point later in Dylan Gabriel's career where he's much more physically developed – much more developed as a passer, as a quarterback, and for them to be synced up at Oklahoma, I think they have a huge opportunity in front of them. Um, I don't know that he wins the award, but I, I truly believe he'll be one of those guys that's in the in the theater when uh, when that award gets announced. That's a good take. I I don't I appreciate hate that. It. I like Mims <laughs> a lot at wide receiver for Oklahoma. I think he's you know their CD, their Hollywood Brown. Um, so, and he, look, he's put up real numbers. I, I want to pick Oklahoma so bad to win. I Venerables just has nothing to base off of head coaching experience. That's the only reason I'm a little hesitant. And I'm a big Mike Gundy fan, even if he did cut off the mullet, which I'm a little disappointed by. Um, but no, I, I don't hate that take. I, I had one the other day and I got a little bit of pushback on it. But when people actually kind of like sat back and looked at it and it was like, okay, it's not the most unrealistic thing. Will Anderson will be a top three finalist for the Heisman Trophy, and he will he will break the all time sack record at forty seven. Hmm. He's at twenty four and a half sacks right now. Wow. He's improved okay. every year. This year, he's I think he's got the best pass rush tandem in the country with him and Dallas Turner. Henry Toto is back. Um, you have you have a fantastic front seven where he's not going to get a lot of double teams he might get chipped on a, on a running back but i'm taking will anderson all day i don't think it's unrealistic that he breaks the all-time season sack record and he breaks the all-time ncaa sack record which is held by terrell suggs and he, i'm not saying he wins the heisman but i think he is in new york for it well, like he should have been last year said aiden hutchinson he was wrong hmm. that. hmm yeah i i don't hate that i don't hate that by any means i think like you said the real question is okay how much are you getting double team? Because every single week they're going to be circling, underlining, and star, and all that on the scouting report with 31. But, yeah, I mean, if if Dallas Turner starts to break loose and he starts to wreak havoc on the defensive line as well, I mean, you can't double both of them. So, no, I think I think there's there's a lot of legitimacy to that, and I'm, I'm excited for us to hopefully get uh, – Get some answers here soon, man. It feels like just tick, 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 tick. We're this close. Oh, I know. I can't wait. Week zero is, uh, I believe, uh, we're – like August twenty seventh. Yeah, I think so. Hawaii and Vanderbilt, which I need that game more. Like I like I'm so excited for that, and I oh, never thought I would epic. say that about at Vanderbilt. Well, man, you have crushed it. I love the fact that I've finally been able to get you on. Uh, big fan of your work. Is there anything you would like to plug? Man, well, one, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm fired up. We got this done. Would love to come back on whenever y'all would have me. Uh, in terms of things to plug, 
our YouTube channel on three is surgeon and would love to have y'all jump on that and, and subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter at JD Pacquiao, but no, man, I'm just excited for us to, to keep this ball rolling and uh, love that, that, you know, we have made this connection. I, I believe, you know, high ties raise all boats here in, in our, in our media industry, quote unquote, I say media pretty loosely, but no, man, this, this has been awesome. I'm fired up and I can't wait to do this again here in the fall. Dude, absolutely. If uh, any college games we're at this year, we got to grab a drink. Let's make it happen. All right. Thanks, man. Appreciate you. Appreciate you.